also one of your recovering coaches. And I'm Karen, also a recovery coach. All right. Okay. Okay. So again, thanks for tuning in to another all recovery meeting. Here, everybody is welcome. We're gonna go over some uh, preliminary things that we have to go over. Uh, today is going to be a lesson that has been provided by a relapse prevention uh, group handout, and it's a uh, Hazel Den. It's provided from Hazel Den, and the handout is like a six-week individualized program. And week to week, we've been going through this particular handout because it deals with relapse prevention and a host of other things. And today, we're just going to go over that particular handout. Sound good to me, Mike? What? All right, I'm going to just go over some things before we begin. Cool. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this All Recovery meeting. My name, again, is Karen. An all recovery meeting welcomes all who struggle with addiction, are affected by addiction, and or who support the recovery lifestyle. An all recovery meeting is non-denominational, meaning all pathways of recovery are embraced here. Today I will choose a universal recovery topic and then we will discuss it. Specifically, an all recovery meeting is not affiliated with any anonymous program although we are likely to hear comments associated with 12-step fellowships. Coming from a place of mutual respect and understanding, let's observe some basic meeting agreements. Please respect the opinions and remarks of others. Please no cross-talking, only one person speaks at a time. Please turn your cell phones off or place them on vibrate. Please refrain from the overuse of profanity in order not to offend others. Are there any announcements? Uh, tune in every Tuesday at 10 a.m. for our meeting. It's called, uh, it's called Coffee and Conversation. Get your coffee ready. Bring your conversation with, with you. Um, we just have, uh, uh, um, if you need anything that's dealing with recovery in that particular area, uh, you can always call us. We have an appointment uh, visitation by appointments only. Um, the number is 856-391-7449. All right, let's begin by introducing ourselves to one another. How you introduce yourself is completely up to you. Again, my name is Karen, and I support recovery. And my name is Michael, one of the recovery coaches, and um, I also have been clean from all use of alcohol and substances since August 2009. Uh, my name is Craig again. I'm, on, I'm also a recovery coach and I'm also in recovery and uh, it feels great to be in recovery. So I encourage all those to do the same. All right, uh, let's have a moment of silence to remember why we are here. Thank you. This is a topic discussion meeting and the topic I have, I have chosen is work and recovery. Mm, sounds and, good. Yeah, sorry. And if we have time, maybe guilt and shame. All right, all right, Karen, you got the best topic. Let's give it up, let's give it up. All right. You may share on this topic or not, or on something else that relates to recovery. Please be mindful of the amount of people in the room and our time frame when sharing. Oh, cool. All right, let's begin. All right. I'll read the top parts. It says, work and recovery. Check which of these following statements describe your situation. It says, I am employed in a demanding job that makes inpatient treatment impossible. I am working in an unsatisfactory job and taking and making change and thinking of making a change. I am working in a situation in which recovery will be difficult. I am unemployed and need to find a job. Mm. Work and recovery. Work and recovery. People in any of these above situations have to deal with certain problems that can make treatment more difficult. Some of the problems are outlined below. The number corresponds to the list above. 
So the first one where it was talking about I am employed in a demanding job that makes inpatient treatment impossible. It says people in this situation always have to look at priorities. Outpatient treatment may have been selected because work is a number one priority. The problem is that treatment won't work unless it is given 100% effort. Treatment won't work unless it is given 100% effort. Although work, it says, is the number one priority, treatment won't work unless you're giving you 100%. That means that for a while, treatment has to take priority over work. Once long, longer term sobriety has been achieved or maintained, the recovery can shift to maintenance intensity and work can again be a major focus. It basically saying once you build your foundation and your um with your recovery, then work can go back to the forefront of being the uh, number one priority. But trying to make treatment a priority and and clash it against making work the priority, it really won't work. You won't be able to give yourself a hundred percent to your um recovery. Actually, this is a good segue for me to tell the story again about what my wife did for me. What I was actively using, and I had a job at that particular time. It was the highest paying job that I have ever had in my life. I was actively addicted to crack cocaine and heroin. And the reason why I didn't want to dedicate myself to treatment was because of the job. Because I had this job, and I never had a uh, this much money at one particular job. So I would not want to go to treatment because of the job. What I didn't know is that my wife called my boss and told him I was using drugs. So the next day that I went to work, my boss said, hey, we got Random you and Mike. I said, yo, Random you and Craig. He said, no, Mike, you. I said, man, you can't say you want a Random you from me. You, you got to be kidding me. I can't take no yarn now. I said, well, let me come back at the work. He said, no, no, no. Take it now. Long story short, the reason why I'm saying that is because, to me, work was my number one priority. But really, I needed to make treatment my number one priority. And I didn't want to leave the, the work because it was a high paying job for me at that time. But my wife knew that uh, when she told me she did that, she says, if you would have kept working and getting that money, you was going to die anyway. And I'd rather have you than you have that job. So you have to balance it out right there. Go ahead, Craig. Let me give you a little scenario on me. So... Mine's is so, somewhat different than yours, Mike, but however, I'm also an ex-offender, so I was on parole. I think I was standing with you, Mike, and I was working, and I had this parole officer, and as long as I was working, giving them clean yards, everything was good. And so this particular parole officer, he got transferred, and so I got a new parole officer. And so he comes to the house and says, you know what, I want you to start going to AA meeting, NA and AA meeting. I said, for well, what? The other officer didn't mind up me working and not going to AA, NA and AA. He said, well, I'm not that other officer. <laughs> this is something that is required upon your parole. Yeah. I said that to say this, that sometimes we often get complacent. Mm -hmm. And so... We, I don't want to encourage people out there, never get too complacent where your recovery you put on the back burner. All right? And so that's just word to the wise. Number two, you want me to read mine? Yeah, go ahead. All right. It says, it is a general accepted fact that during recovery, major changes in job, relationships, and other areas should be delayed for six months to one year whenever possible. There are many reasons for this. A- People in recovery go through large changes themselves and sometimes change their views on personal situations. Or B, any change in stressful and major stress says, hold on, let me read that again. B, any change is stressful and major stress is to be avoided as much as possible during early recovery. Yeah, it says, it says you should generally 
Accept the fact that doing recovery, major changes in jobs, relationships, other areas should be delayed. It should be delayed. Now, is it a is it a hurdle that a lot of people will not cross or jump? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the reason why you want to delay because of a when they were saying people in recovery go through large changes themselves and sometimes change their view views on personal situations. Sometimes people who are have been using a substance for a long period of time only are attracted to someone possibly who are using the substance. And then when they get clean, they are no longer attracted to the person who probably was using the substance. These situations may arise. And when your views of personal situations or personal people change, that's why they say don't get into some relationships and certain things like that because you might have changed not only uh, the not using part, but the things you used to like might even change. Your taste buds might change overall. Mm, taste buds, no. <laughs> exquisite taste. You know, gain exquisite yeah, taste. Now you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my wife said I got bougie. <laughs> <laughs> she said, man, my husband, I'll be like, man, I need this. I she said, man, my husband, I got bougie. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, now you want all this stuff. Yeah. Upgrade. Yeah, man. Hey. Anybody out there in the audience? Anybody out there. If uh -huh. you want to log on, hit the link and you can join us from the other end and you can ask questions or you can discuss anything you want to discuss. Here, pop up. All right. Anybody would like to join, you can, you're welcome to join. You can share during the topic as well if you would like to share. Mm -hmm. Hello, welcome. Uh, Can you hear us? Hello. Hey, welcome. Hello. Hello, yes, hi, how are you doing? How are you? You want to join the show? You can share anytime you have something you want to share, okay? Who are you? Okay. I'm John Music. John Music! Oh, hi, Mr. Hey, how's it going? Hi, man. My name, man. <laughs> hey, John. I'm sorry to be late. I have to go for a psychiatric evaluation that I, uh, I just got done with that. I figured I'd call in. Better be a little bit late than not calling in at all. Yes, man. Welcome. Well, we appreciate you, John. We're talking about what, Mike, today? Uh, I don't know. Work but, and recovery. Uh, work and recovery. <laughs> work and recovery. We're talking about work and recovery. Right now, I'm about to read something. It says some jobs, some jobs lend themselves to recovery more than others. Work situations that are difficult to combine with outpatient treatment include the following. Situations in which it is necessary to be with other people who are drinking or using. Jobs that make large sums of cash money available at, or at unpredictable times. Mm -hmm. So some jobs, some jobs lend themselves to recovery more than others. What that simply means is if you're in your recovery and you're at this particular uh, establishment or job, that employer might support that type of uh, recovery thing. And to the point where they might tell people, listen, we have such and such here who's in his recovery. I don't want you guys doing this stuff around him no more or boom, boom, boom. But some establishment might be like, we don't care about you being on recovery. We have breaks over here. We drinking and we drugging and we doing that. So you have to understand that some jobs will vary. But you have to um, make the decision at what stage you are in your recovery. Is it... Uh, more important to leave this establishment or just stick it out until you can find something suitable to your sobriety. I like the first bullet point. It says, situation in which it is necessary to be with other people who are drinking or using. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you may find yourself employed at a place where they do serve alcohol. And so you have to be more strong and be more willing to say, hey, all right. This is something going to, I don't think I'm going to do forever yeah. because it may jeopardize my sobriety. Yeah. And so be mindful of that because a lot of times we are placed in situations where we might work at a restaurant yeah. and they may have those type of things available. But hey, 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 John, is there anything you would like to add on today? I'm sorry, what did you say? Is there anything you would like to add on? Would you like to um, comment or share your story or anything of recovery? 
No, I mean, it, it's true when you get paid large sums of money, it makes it really easy to realize that's for damn sure, but uh, mm -hmm. you just got to figure out a way to get through that and not be shocked with that money. That's true. I know that made me relax it very easy when I had lots of money. It was easy to justify it and hide my using because I had to get some good money coming in. Right, right. Mm-hmm. That's true. Cool. That's, that's a good point, uh, John, because a lot of times some people are uh, addicted to getting money. It's called adrenaline rush. Yeah. And so a lot of times if we don't manage our money appropriately, uh, like you said, John, we may uh, end up in a spell on a spiral downhill. Relapse. Relapse. It's called relapse, huh? Some jobs require long or unusual hours. Often the very nature of the schedule has contributed to the drug or alcohol problem in the first place. The first task, if you have such a job, is to work with your therapist or your boss or someone else at your job to make your schedule work for your recovery. Woohoo! Without this initial intervention, your recovery will not stand a chance. Recovery is much too difficult a process unless it is your number one priority while you are in treatment or out of treatment for that matter. This particular the handout is talking about when people were in treatment. But your recovery, your sobriety is your number one priority. I know it sounds like really corny, especially me. I'm a spiritual uh, uh, faith type of person and I'm always trying to see how I can be a blessing or help someone else. But in recovery, you first have to make sure you are the number one priority, your sobriety. Because if you don't take care of you, you won't be able to build your marriage or restore your marriage or build your relationship with your children. And if we're honest, eventually the job will go too if you don't deal with your um, sobriety or your recovery and take care of that. The job will be there for a moment, but eventually all that stuff will go away. And, and shockingly... Uh, anybody, a lot of people in recovery who have experienced relapse can testify to this. No matter how long you uh, had had stayed clean, let's say you got 12 years clean, let's just use that number, and you relapse, the fall back to the bottom happens quick. <laughs> Yo, you can have 12 years clean, but as soon as you relapse, it seems like you go right back to the bottom fast. I don't know why it's like that, but you drop immediately back to where you were. And that is waking up that sleeping tiger that's mm. waiting to be fed. And Mike is right. You know, oftentimes we think we can just continue off where we left off. However, that's not, that don't be the case because a lot of times our appetite has become greater and greater. And so be mindful of that. We're just trying to share some information. And so, is there anything anybody else that's out there that would like to share? Please join in. You're welcome. Go ahead, Ms. Karen. You want it? Uh, number five says, when people are out of work, treatment becomes more difficult. Mm. Looking for work is often a necessary priority. Without blocks of time spent at work, there is much free time that it is difficult to fill it and provide the structure that makes outpatient treatment effective. Yeah. Resources are often limited, making factors like transportation and child care more of a problem. Mm. That's very good because a lot of times uh, we can get frustrated in our quest to stay, stay clean um, while looking for jobs and then there's a lot of doors that's closed in our face. And so be mindful of that, uh, those type of things. And so if you need help, Looking for employment, please contact us here at Capital Recovery Center. Yeah. And so we can help you with that. We can lift the load of some of the burdens that you may find as far as gaining employment. Anything yep. else? Because we can give you, uh, here at Capital Recovery Center, we can connect you with resources for employment. However, you will have to do the footwork. We connect you uh, with the opportunity. Uh, however, uh, again, we need you to put in the work, the dedication to your own particular recovery. I always use the analogy of a coach, literally, who gives a play to his players. But the players go in the game to execute the play that the coach gave them. So we are simply here to create a play, 
give it to you, you have to execute the plan. If you're looking for work, it's often a necessary priority. However, it is a frustrating one. Resources are often more limited, making factors like transportation and childcare more of a problem. We understand those limitations, especially when you're coming out of uh, an addictive lifestyle of the things you might need when you're looking for employment. But I'm simply here to tell you, never ever give up. You never know where someone might hire you. One of the strategies, I, uh, and when, if you're looking for employment, this is one of the strategies that my mother taught me that I used uh, all my life when I was looking for jobs. She said, you only, if you're going to look for a job, what you usually look for inside of a window. And I was like, if I'm looking for a job, what I'm looking for inside of a window? She said, help one in sign. You're looking for it. She says, go to the places that don't have help one in signs and ask them, do they need any help? And I said, why would I do that? She said, there's always somebody who never likes to show up for work. And you might go in there that day when the boss is fed up. <laughs> I, said, I said, that's a good idea. So she said, everybody are going to the places where it says help wanted. But no one is going to the place where there's no sign, but somebody always mess up. And this, she proved that to be true. I was working at a place and the guy was the cook. I didn't know how to do any of his position. And I was the dishwasher. I would come to work every day. He would always do no call, no show. And then one day my boss was like, Mike, get behind there. You're the cook today. I said, I'm not, I don't know how to cook. And I got the, I got the job. I was a prep cook. I got the job. We had a head cook. I was the one to get the food for him to cook. I was a prep cook. But I didn't know how to do it, but I got the job. So don't never give up. Even if you're looking for employment and you don't have transportation, child care, and that stuff, it's always somebody out there looking for trying to hire someone. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Where we at, guys? Uh, let's go. That's the end of the... What this say? It says, there are no easy solutions to these problems. It is important to be aware of the issues so you can plan to make your recovery as strong as possible. And that's like a blueprint to why we're going over all of these things week after week. Again, you can go to our YouTube page, uh, Cumberland County Human Services, and watch all our previous videos on YouTube. But we're doing all of this because we know it's not an easy solution to these problems, and we want to just make you aware to the problem. Hey, John, let me ask you a question. Are you still there? Yeah. This is Craig. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, are you in recovery? Yeah. Okay. I've been in recovery for a long time now. For over three years. Been nothing in treatment. Nice. Nice. If you don't mind sharing, uh, how, how is that coming along for you? Now, are you are you receiving any type of uh, IOP uh, intensive outpatient, any type of virtual meetings that besides this one? No, I, I just meet with a counselor for about a half hour every week. Over the phone, now that the COVID's been out, I just meet with a counselor about once a month. And then I attend a couple of meetings here and there for my recovery house, more than the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, how you like those? Those great? They was good, good uh, information? attending to my family. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. I am hopeless and worthless. Me, myself, I may mention that I am in recovery, and I spent a lot of years uh, from adolescent all the way to adulthood 
uh, dipping and dabbing or indulging in some type of either alcohol or substance use disorder. And I know for personally that I have caused a lot of damage to my family. So uh, I was glad once I got in recovery that I can show or give back to my family that which I have taken away. And uh, for a lot of people uh, coming from treatment facilities or who's in recovery, a lot of times there's a trust, you know, not only shame and guilt on our part, but there's a trust factor when family members, when they, you know, you say, I'm clean, you know, I'm getting myself together, and I want to do right. Yeah. But then, you know, they look at you and say, well, prove yourself. Yeah, you, you said that before. You said that. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it all before. <laughs> yeah, so you got to do some uh, evidence, but I'll call it providing evidence. And, and it's nothing about... Um, you you want to give them the evidence. I had the uh, desire to want to, or I had this terminology when, for example, if somebody said, you're going to always be on drugs, Michael. Now, I had so much pride in my heart not knowing that I wanted to prove them so wrong that I wouldn't use drugs just so they wouldn't be right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That wasn't not the, the re that wasn't the... The more, that was my one of my motivating factors to not use again is because I just didn't want them to be right. Yeah. But it turned out to be in my favor. But at the same time, you got to live your life to prove people um, wrong. You know what I mean? Because people going to think you don't want to live for them, but you want to uh, feel good about yourself. But feeling guilty when you feel guilty about something is not really a, a real bad thing. And when you start to feel shame and let the gate guilt eat you up, it can take you into a depression state. Yeah, like the statement said, I am hopeless and worthless. Yeah, you start to feel the shame. That's a self-defeated attitude that one began to uh, incorporate instead of having a mindset that says, I'm greater than yeah. what I am uh, taking myself through right now. I can be someone better, you know. So, uh, yeah, in our addiction, you know, we, we do let a lot of people down. We yeah. do feel shameful. You know, but don't let the shame, guilt and shame to drive you into depression and then you go into a mental uh, state of mind over the uh, mess ups. Um, I always think we should be upset when we mess up, but not to the point where we're beating ourselves down 24-7. Because honestly, especially if, if when we do slip, relapse, whatever you want to title it, when you do go to that place... Um, you don't need an outside source to tell you anything. Your conscious mind will be beating you up. <laughs> yeah. Your conscious mind will be tearing you up. But you got to get past that. Feeling guilty, it says, is a healthy reaction. It's a healthy reaction. It often means you have done something that doesn't agree with your values and morals. Also, you can tie into that uh, secrets. The reason why they call them secrets... Um, is because when you do stuff like that in the secret, you know something is wrong because you want. That's why you're sneaking and doing it. But when something doesn't line up to your values and your morals, uh, you feel guilty. But that's a normal reaction. Yeah. You're like, man, I know better than this. I know. I was taught better. I was, I was taught better. better. I know better. So I feel guilty. Uh, it is not unusual for people to get into a situation where they do things they feel guilty about. What is important is making peace with yourself. Powerful. Make peace with yourself. Sometimes that means making up for the things you said and done. Sometimes it means realizing you are feeling guilty unnecessarily. Just make peace with yourself. Uh, I love the, the term, um, just let it go. Huh. Just let it go. One day at a time. Let it go. Keep moving. Because you, uh, one of my motivational speakers always said you might as well go into tomorrow because yesterday ain't going to ask you how you're doing. <laughs> you might as well go ahead and deal with tomorrow. Because yesterday definitely ain't going to come knock on your shoulder and say, hey, how you doing? So basically you got to make peace with yourself and just let it go. You know, and I have to say guilt and shame doesn't just come from the fact who is suffering from the substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Guilt and shame also carries on the family member. 
I know I felt a lot of guilt and shame. I had I felt I had feelings of things that I never thought I would I wanted to wish on a person. But when yeah. situations when I was in a situation, I just that's how I felt and then I I kind of like realized what I was feeling and I said that's not right. So guilt and shame also carries a long way to family members and it took me a while to and it's still taking me a while to try and recover from all that from all the you know like the emotional trauma the everything that a person goes through also just witnessing the person pretty much kill themselves mm, right yeah. so for me it's it's been a big step and and I know that um, I still have a lot to work on that. That's why I guess sometimes I, I, I talk very little or I'm very like, I feel very barricaded sometimes. Well, you make a great analogy. Uh, and, yeah, and, and it takes, and she said something, she said when you do feel guilt and shame, if you do, it takes time. It's not something that you, for you to get over uh, just like that. So don't compare yourself one to another. You see somebody who may have, for instance, when someone is grieving, you might see this person grieving. You might, I know people who have been grieving a death for 10 years. And I know some people who have grieved uh, ex extensively for a year, but they just have their little moments periodically. But I'm talking about people who still don't go out the house. They keep their blinds down. I'm like, it's been 10 years. But I can't determine how long it's going to take somebody to get over grief and shame. And most of the time, when someone is grieving for that long period of time, that's what they stuck with. Or that's what they're dealing with. Something happened about guilt and shame and they can't, like, amend it or, or make it right with that person when they have passed or moved on. So, yeah, it takes time to get over your guilt and shame. So while the person is alive, why not? Let it go and just say go to a woman and try to make, make amends. Make amends. Say, yeah. Yeah. Even if they don't receive it. Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes you can tell somebody, listen, I'm sorry they say, but I don't care. Jump off the roof. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And we was watching a movie last night and a person, uh, a kid, a father's kid got killed. <clears throat> he took he took the person who killed his son hostage. The hostage negotiator called into the place where he had him hostage, and he says, what you want? He said, my son, mm. call me back when you got him. <laughs> and they just thought, like, we can't bring his son back. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, some things you can't, even if, if, if you know, you forgive a person and they don't forgive you, it, there's nothing you can do about that. As long as you forgive, oh, man, they don't receive your forgiveness. You can just, just let it, just keep moving. Just make amends and just, you got to let it go. I like these last three uh, reminders. And number one, it says, it's all, it's all right to make mistakes. Wow. Number two, it says, it's all right to say, I don't know. I don't care or I don't understand. So right to say that. Huh? It's one of the hardest things people to say. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Seek help and say, hey, I, I don't know it all. I don't know. <laughs> Number three, it says, you don't have to explain yourself to anyone if you're acting responsibly. Yeah. And so as long as you are doing the right thing, keep on trucking. You don't have to explain anything. Mm -hmm. All right, where we at? We don't say we on shame. So shame, check the statement that may apply. I feel ashamed because I'm addicted. I feel weak because I couldn't go, couldn't or can't stop drinking or using. I feel stupid because what I have done. I feel like I am a bad person because I am involved with alcohol and other drugs. Alcohol and other drugs. No one knows all the reasons that someone can stop using. Some people can stop using. We were just talking about this. No one knows all the reasons that some people can stop using once they decide and others people cannot. We were just saying that with the guy who was watching Hollywood Henderson. It was like, you know, some people just get it and some people uh, don't. I always thought that, <coughs> excuse me, age would help people get certain situations with addiction or whatever. But I noticed... Um, that people who was living the bad lifestyle when my mom and dad was doing it are still out there. 
I said, hold on, no, that's not supposed to be, y'all not supposed to be out here with me. I thought, age, like, no, you, you're too old now, you got to quit. You grow out of it. I thought that's what it was, I thought, until I'm like, hold on, this is my mom and them friends that used to be out here. Yeah. But that's not it, you know. So no one knows the reason. Research shows that some of the reasons have to do with family histories, genes, individual f physical differences in people. They do not have to be with some people being bad, stupid, or weak. Addiction affects people differently. That's why you can see someone um, go through something and get right out of it. Some of them be in it for years. It sucks, but it, it affects people differently. Yeah. What we do know is that you cannot recover by these means. Trying to use willpower, trying to be strong, and trying to be good. <laughs> it takes two things to make a recovery work. Here it is. Being smart and working hard. Being smart, smart, making a good support system, and working hard. All right. The last part, and we'll probably be out of here, I'm not sure. Yeah, what you got? Go ahead, you can read it. It says, everyone who was successful at recovery will tell you, it was the hardest thing I ever did. No one can do it for you, and it would not just happen to you. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. But it's also the most rewarding thing uh -huh. I ever did. <laughs> That's right. It's the hardest thing for you to do. And it will be by far the most rewarding thing that you will ever do in your life. Okay, so that would be another lesson next week. We'll be here Tuesday, 10 o'clock uh, with coffee and conversation. Uh, Mr. John, you got anything? You want a copy? Okay. Yeah, um, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just didn't know what, what, what you guys were reading from. I can email it to you. I wasn't sure. You got to do it. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I, I might not uh, just evaluate it. I came out to ask you a question. I'm sorry. I've been outside waiting to listen to you guys. I'm sorry. If the wind's been bothering you guys or anything. No, we got to get your email. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we can email you the handout if you have an email. Sure. That would just be my first and last name at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Got it. So we'll send you. I'll send email. it to you. And then this is every Thursday or is it every Tuesday? Every Thursday at 1. We're going to be going over okay. the handout. And Tuesday we have. No, it just turns into Tuesday. Tuesday yeah, I'll see. Tuesday, I'll cut you off. Tuesday is um, a different meeting. It's a coffee and conversation at 10 in the morning. Oh, okay. Very good. I'll send right. you the flyers too. To the schedule and everything. I'll send them. All right, well, thank you for joining us. All right, well, thank you very much. Have a good day. You as well. All right, all right, John. Thank you for tuning in, man. I want to thank everybody for coming, tuning in for the All Recovery Me here at Capital Recovery Center. I'm one of your recovery coaches. My name is Michael Williams. And I am Craig, also your recovery coach as well. And I am Karen, and I'm just going to give you guys a closing statement. So, uh, in closing, I would like to thank you all for coming today. We close an all-recovery meeting with a positive affirmation about ourselves, followed by a moment of silence to remember why we are here. So, what is what is the motto we learned? Work hard. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Work hard. It's not going to be easy. And also, do not be down on yourself by saying that I am hopeless or I am worthless. Because you're more than that to yourself. And also, feeling guilty is a healthy reaction. It often means you have done something that goes against your morals and your values. All right. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Month, Thursday, Thursday, 1 o'clock. All right, guys. Got it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Capital recovery. Got it.